All right, looks like we're live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the December 16th, 2021 Finance Committee meeting. We'll call the meeting to order at 7.05 p.m. and I will do a quick roll call. Um, we'll start, I'll just go by what I see on the screen. So um, Mayor Pro Tem George Turner. Here. Dave Marcus. Present. Angela Ash. Here. Lakeisha Swanson. Here. Via Scruggs. She's here. <laughs> awesome. And um, if Michael comes on, we'll add him to the attendance. Thanks everyone for joining us. Welcome to the final meeting of the year. Yay! <laughs> we made it. I know it was a short year, um, but we've made it to the end of this year and look forward to all the things we have in store for next year. But we're gonna round this year off by going over a couple of things on the agenda. Um, we've, got, we've got the financial management policy review We'll go over the fleet policy. Um, we'll look back at really quickly the finance, I mean, the uh, purchasing and purchasing car policy. And then uh, we'll round off with kind of what we plan to do um, in January to present all of our feedback and policies to the council. Uh, so let's jump right in and let's start with the financial management policy. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, let's see, maybe. Here we go. Every time I do this, my Zoom disappears. I gotta figure out why that does that. Okay, can you see my screen? Can you see the policy? Oh, yes, you're good. Yes. Perfect. Is it large enough? Do I need to make it a little yeah. larger? Can you scroll to text? Yeah, there you go. That's larger. Yeah, that's much bigger. And hold on one second. Let me grab this because my notes are on here and put it on the other page on my other screen. Okay. Can you still see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, G and I will start by kind of telling you where we focused on the some areas we thought needed the most attention, um, which really isn't that much. And then we can go into uh, your feedback and what you saw as you went through the policy. And if we need to kind of go through again, kind of just together certain sections, we can do that as well. Um, but we'll start with, and I'll just introduce it to you. And then if you wanna throw some detail in there, feel free. Um, we'll start with section three. So section three has um, this travel and meal policy. It has the purchasing and credit card um, section and then it has the purchasing policy section. So as we were going through um, this, what we were thinking about was how to keep all of our policies reconciled against each other um, and how to make sure that when we make a policy change that if it is referenced in other policies that we have an easy process to go back and um, update them all. So as we were talking through that, we thought to ourselves, um, why embed one policy into another? Why not reference the policy, especially if it exists by itself? Why not just reference the policy in the financial management policy so that um, we aren't, we don't mistake anything or we don't, just overlook something and not update things everywhere across the board. So when we looked at the travel and meal policy, um, we know that is a standalone policy, the travel policy, which we went through a meeting or so ago. Uh, purchasing and credit cards is also its own policy. Um, so, and P cards is its own policy. So we thought, what if we took those three topics or chapters out of this section and when, it, when we talk about those items, though, just reference the individual policy itself. 
so that whoever is reading this policy, whether as staff, elected officials, or, gen- or the general public, um, that we can even hyperlink uh, the policy to it, but not to reference it or not to really embed it in here, just to reference it. So that's generally an overview of kind of what we thought was worth removing from here. So let's get your feedback on that. And then Gia, well, Gia, let me let you add something if you want to add. And then let's get some feedback about that recommendation. And then we'll take any other recommendations that you might have saw throughout the policy. Council Woman Carter, Council Woman Carter, Chair Carter, you did a great job in introducing that in the investigation process. So I'm, I'm good with that. I'm really, um, really would like to hear what the committee has to say regarding that piece of it, just the pieces out. Perfect. All right. Madam so Chair, jump in. any feedback? Madam Chair? Yes. Um, one of my favorite tools is uh, Municode. And ultimately all of this would be uh, uh, roll up to Municode if it's not already there, mm-hmm. just a matter when it uh, is fully rolled out. And uh, it really doesn't matter where it is, as long as we are able to access it uh, readily and uh, get what we need from it. So uh, it, 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 it really doesn't matter to me where it is, as long as we can access it by way of Municode uh, conveniently. Yes, we will definitely um, make sure that all of the policies and any updates you can find in Municode, because that's what we're doing for the entire city, for every single thing we can possibly think of, <laughs> to be um, our kind of repository for records. Um, so it would definitely be in there, which would make it even easier if, if the text wasn't embedded in this policy, um, because we can just reference it, send it right to Municode, send the link right to Municode, and it'll be right there at the fingertips. It's just the the text being embedded means you have to go in and change that text every time you make an update to it, which can be done, but it is a little arduous. And it's up to humans to remember to reconcile it and get it right. I tend to think that people would be more likely to get it right if it was all in one document. That is because they'd have the rest of it, at least if it's printed, they'll have the rest of it in front of them if they're looking at it. I also, um, when I'm reading like long complex things, I'd like to be able to flip back and forth and put a paper clip in something, et cetera. And for that kind of stuff, I'll, I'll use a, a printed copy rather than online. And if I was a new employee, I'm trying to put that hat on and had to learn some of this stuff, would I rather go from document to document and back and forth or would I rather have it in one place? And I think I'd rather have it in one place, in particular, because I would expect that parts of this maybe would be referenced or be in an employee handbook for new hires. So I'm, I'm, I totally see your point, and I don't know if your point is, I don't know which is, is more important or how we reconcile it all, but the question of new employees and how they will learn and understand the policy is something we should take a look at. Yes, and Gia may have a little bit more insight on what we plan on giving to employees from the finance side of making sure they understand the most certainly. Um, well, the purchasing cards are different because now there's only two employees who can have a purchasing card. Um, but the purchasing policy and the process is for sure. Of course, those who have approval levels have to have that information and sign off on training and understanding. So she may be able to dive into that a little bit more of what finance is preparing for that new hire um, training and review. Um, But one thing I can address, uh, Dave, is I don't think it was ever the idea to not have the policy standalone in addition to the financial management policy. So it will be either it's embedded in this policy as it is now and remains there and they are separate or we just take the embedding out. But I don't think it was ever the intention on just making every policy, I mean, combining all policies into one. So like the travel policy now is standalone. 
the purchasing policy is standalone, the purchasing card policy is standalone. I don't think that there's any intention to, to consolidate all of that into one financial management policy. So like I said, it's probably either we keep them separate and it's embedded here, or we don't embed it and we just refer to it. But I don't think, and Gia, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there was ever an intention on eliminating the individual policies and only having them in one. That's correct. And Dave, if I'm not mistaken, Gia, you can help me with this. I'm almost certain that our auditors recommended that the policies are standalone, especially so that like the purchasing and the purchasing card, that there's an individual attestation to uh, following and acknowledging the rules versus there being one for like the entire finance policy in general. So that's one of the reasons why the intention- sounds, sounds good, enough said. Okay. I'll just make a comment. This is Angela. So, um, and, and I would just say, I'm glad, thank you for clarifying that further because I was going to ask a question about the separate policies. And so um, I see it as, you know, a separate purchasing policy, a separate travel, but not necessarily embedding all of that in this finance policy. Because to me, it is confusing to see it in the financial manager policy. When I first start looking at it, then we got a purchasing policy. Yeah. It was kind of confusing. And so, yeah. um, like you're saying, if you're saying what we're looking at now, the financial management policy, all the language related to the purchasing and credit card policy, for example, you're saying it may just reference that policy, wherever that's going to be housed. Is that the intent there in referencing the traveling meal policy and not regurgitate all the same language? Because that would be cumbersome, I would think, to try to update both. Because if you update the separate policies, the assumption is when someone goes to that link, it'll be updated versus trying to do both in both documents. So if they're going to remain separate policies, traveling meal policy, P-card policy, purchasing policy, then I would say to me, removing all the language in the financial management policies and referencing those policies for ease of um, changes and so forth and updates as well. Okay. Perfect. And in my prior, they find you know prior work my government experience that yeah, we've had, they've had separate travel policies, purchasing P card policies, and so well. And I'm just looking at your section that says purchasing a credit card, and you have a purchasing policy. It was just throwing me off when I saw purchasing. And I'm glad card. you said that because yeah. I had the same problem until I realized. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure what we're talking about on the purchase. I, I know you're talking about P cards, but maybe that needs to be retitled, yeah. or maybe they go together. It's it's okay. purchasing cards and credit cards. <laughs> Sort of right. Okay. Yeah. The one is credit cards, basically, and call them government cards, credit cards, and the other one is just purchasing policy in general. So one is just, this, I was going to scroll to it, but one is just specific to credit cards. Oh, okay. Okay. And then okay. this is the actual purchasing policy and process. I get you. Okay. At least that's the way I remember anyway. Okay. Which, which sometimes they, I know in the past, they work together per se, because the purchasing department or procurement folks handled the distribution, all that of the P cards, but that may not be the case here. But no, it definitely is. But of course, that's in the most recent update to okay. the P card policy. Okay. 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 You, you want to provide some clarity there? You're hearing with that. Yes, um, I'm hoping it's going to be clarity, but it's also a little bit more detail. So, in the pur current purchasing policy, the P our credit card policy is actually an appendix. So we'll also have to separate that out. Right. Oh. I'm scrolling to it now. It's yeah, so it's here. at the bottom of, I think. So it's going to be a part of the. So now that'll be a standalone policy. The purchasing card policy will not be an appendix of the purchasing policy. It will right. be its own policy. Right, we see it here, Angela, mm -hmm. on the appendix. Yes, yeah. uh -huh. So that was one of the, that was a little down further on the agenda, but this is another recommendation that we were going to bring was that we take this out of the purchasing policy and make the purchasing card policy its own standalone, where it's not, like Gia said, in the appendix. So to keep all of that, again, still smooth and reconciled, 
we would need to take it out of here as well. So it's to your point, it's definitely a little confusing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> okay. Lakeisha, did I see you um, hop in to say something? I did, but um, what Angela was saying, uh, Gia clarified it. I had a question, but what Angela was saying, I was um, going to ask for clarity so it makes more sense now with the separate policy and the standalone. Okay. And actually, what's funny is I'm looking when we, so this section is purchasing and credit card, but it's, it really should just say purchasing card, credit card, something like that. So we know it's all about credit card. Credit card. Yeah. Right. That's what it should say. But nonetheless, it still needs to, this is another reason why we want to pull it out because we made changes to the purchasing card policy that aren't reflected here yet. So like these transaction limits, this purchasing limits, mm -hmm. um, those would they need to be updated. Oh, um, I see. But if we just pull it out, it won't matter. You know, we'll just oh, I see. I see. Give it policy. Okay. Yeah. So that's why we thought, you know, oh wow, it would take well, anyway. I don't have to keep beating a horse, but we just wanted to make sure that we weren't depending on a human to remember to go back and reconcile and how we make that easier so our policies are always updated. And like I said, that the attestation to me was the most important part that we had that separate and we could account for it and refer back to it so that we know for sure mm -hmm. you understood your responsibilities and you signed off on that. Now, the uh, another thing I'd like to mention is probably irrelevant. I'm good at that, you know, um, but that is at, e in, at the front of each of these policies, I'd love to see a paragraph or no, not a paragraph, a list of bullets that says, this is basically the key things you need to know. Um, a summary of the... Yeah, now, but I say that's probably irrelevant because if there's going to be training material for people, it's going to be in there. So um, it, yes. I'd like to see it somewhere. I'm glad you brought that back up. Gia, do you want to talk a little bit about um, what the finance team, I say the, like you're not a part of it, but what your finance team um, is doing or what your plans are for that kind of new hire training as we work through transition? Know that we're still in the transition period, so we're still building and creating. Um, but and, and it might be preliminary, Gia, so don't worry about it being X in stone. But just kind of talk us through some of um, what your thoughts are around how you plan on doing that for new hires and new hire training and handbooks and all that. Yeah, so, um, and we just, we're, like you said, we're in the process of this transition, but we're also putting together an SOP so that it also, it mentions these same policies, but we have step-by-step -step procedures for the things that are outlined in the policy so that the procedures are based on the policy. So if you're looking at one, it kind of refers back to each other. And, and it's easier to train and follow because we reference which policy the process is, is going, going to, if that makes sense. So for instance, um, um, if you're making a purchase or something like that, it references making sure that you have a requisition, looking at the thresholds, you're doing those types of things and making sure the workflow is the same as the policy says it should be. So if it requires department head, signature, city manager, finance director, purchasing agent, that all of that is um, the same information that is in the actual policy itself. So we're um, also working on procedures as we're working on policies. Awesome. Okay, so other than kind of some general, just going back through, making sure all the grammatical things are correct, making sure the references to codes are correct, making sure that um, we reference the city everywhere, just other than some of the general run-of-the-mill kind of updates, that was our largest 
um, recommendation was to remove those sections that those chapters from section three. Um, did let's talk through some of the recommendations you all have from your review um, of the policy. Any areas you feel that we were that we're missing that we should add, or any areas where you feel we need to add more to what's existing? I would like to say that I think we need a policy on tax abatements. Well, that's an interesting topic right there, Jay. That's that's one we definitely need a separate meeting on. For sure. There's a yeah, I don't disagree with you at all. Um I I think it should be a separate policy and a, and a meeting with those who know it better than I, for sure. Um, but I There's also a great deal of philo philosophy behind that, and I'm not sure it's in our pay grade, unless you decide it is. Yeah, I don't. It's not in mine, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Which means another section. Yeah. Which means another policy. Yeah. Yeah. Another section to to root to send the leader to another policy. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other thing that I noticed was it was just something in the language up front where it said this applies to something like all money that the city has and some other money. Um, and I th don't know if, let's see, where is it? Is it in this general section? Y yeah, yeah, scope. Okay. Um, funds, which are the responsibility under the management of the. Oh, well, we need to change that to some press. Yeah, the um. Right now, the city has some money that perhaps belongs to various authorities or other organizations that think they're authorities. I wonder two things. One is whether that needs to be spelled out here, or if that's just such a short term thing, it doesn't need to be. And the other is, is there anything in here where we want to say that if there is an IGA with an authority or other body, that the city's policy is to make the best effort to have that IGA match the city's financial policies? So that the authority then adopts similar policies. Okay, let me, I'm gonna repeat that back to you, but I'm gonna go with the first one and then I'll ask you, I'll repeat back the second one. So the first recommendation, well, let me let me add some clarity and then maybe that will or will not keep your recommendation the same. The only reason why we are in possession of funds from the authorities is because those funds were in our city accounts. Otherwise, we would not be in possession of them. Um, there was um, um, some of those funds we determined truly belonged to the city and some of them, and were rightfully in a city account. And some of those funds belong to, rightfully belong to the authorities. But the only reason that we have possession of them is because they were in our accounts. Moving forward, authority, that shouldn't happen again. Um, of course, you know, things happen that you can't predict, but the way we have the finance department set up now, that should not happen again because no bank account should be opened under the city's EIN if it's not the city manager or the CFO or the elected official assigned to sign off on that. Um, so that should not We've put policy in place with the council to make it so that that should not happen again. So I don't think, and, and please, by all means, throw your feedback in. I don't think it's necessary to add that in there because that was really procedural errors that unfortunately just were well beyond our awareness. But once we were made aware, we came back and made policy corrections. So that should not happen again um, based on the policies and the ordinances that we have in place now. So I don't think it's actually necessary because again, we've corrected it, but if throw your feedback out there just to make sure we got all bases covered on that one. 
Okay. Um, if it's if it's short term and not likely to recur, I don't think it needs to be addressed. Uh, may I add to that? Yes. And 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 that is that in most of the uh, bylaws of these uh, auxiliary groups, for one of another term, uh, they are encouraged to follow similar. Uh, practices as the council in terms of the way they conduct their meetings. And I would suspect the same thing would uh, apply to the way they conduct their financial uh, matters. So uh, I don't know how it would be incorporated, but to put that in IGA, if you will, to uh, suggest it or require it, that if you're going to do business with the city or in the city's name, any kind of way, then we would expect you to follow uh, similar guidelines that are established by the city. And that would include uh, the financial policy, uh, the rules of order, and so forth and so on. Just a thought, but uh, I do think you're moving into a totally different arena. Councilman, my thought is that these bodies can change their bylaws at will without any approval from anybody in the world, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. and um, I, 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 well, uh, if I could just, uh, inject, and some of them, it said they can change that bylaw with the approval of city council. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it applies to the authorities. I know that that is the case with the URA, is that their bylaw can only be changed with the approval of the council. Right. I think you're right there. I don't think it applies to like the development authority, the housing authority. Okay. But it definitely applies to an urban redevelopment agency or a downtown development agency. Do we have a downtown development agency? No, we don't. I was just giving no. an example okay. of <laughs> Um and second, I would say that if it's in an IGA the city can hold their feet to the fire, I think, more than if it is in the bylaws. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that one is more enforceable than the other. Um, because some of them, like for instance, the um, housing authority, and this may be applicable to the development authority, but by law, they have to have bylaws. Um, so that has a statute atta attached to it. So I don't know that an IGA would trump the statute. So I'm not sure. I'd have to ask legal. I'm not sure which one is more enforceable than the other or more powerful than the other. But I agree with you and Councilman Turner that the language um, for the authorities or some of these other auxiliary um, groups in an IGA should include their agreeance to following as closely as possible city financial policies. And um, we could also heavily suggest that they add that to their bylaw so that it's in both places. I don't know that it's appropriate to put that in our financial management policy, but we do need to find wherever we can put that suggested language, rather it's somebody remembering when we look at an IGA, hey, make sure that financial section is there. Um, I think we need to find a good place so we can remember to make sure that's included, but I don't know if putting it in here is the most appropriate place. I wrote the note down though, Dave. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the best place um, either. The charter might be a good place. That's a good start. That's a good start. In the meantime, I've got the note. <laughs> Gia, we'll make sure Gia gets the note. And we'll make sure legal gets the note. That way, when we do have IGAs that come before us or um, um, that we can make sure that between legal and finance and somebody else's memory, that that portion is in there to heavily suggest that their bylaws include that um, and as well as the IGA. So that's a really good suggestion. We just got to find the best place to put it. Anything else on the financial management policy? Yeah, I do. I have a couple questions on the 
uh, grants management section. So, uh, let's see. So under the um, grant application, I guess page 16. So one question I have is, um, it says the city manager shall approve grant applications and submissions that follow, you know, blah, blah, blah. So my question is, um, I don't see in here where the council approves any grant. So is that part of the process for the council or the executive body to approve grants at all? Not today. Talk hmm. uh, not today, but Gia, do you recall in the purchasing policy? And I'm so mad that I don't because I try to memorize the daggone thing. Um, because this sentence here says city manager should approve grant applications and submissions that blah 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 for, for the application and acceptance of the grant. And so I would tip I would think the council somewhere, I would say, should uh, have the acceptance somewhere of a grant as the governing body. I'm looking at the finance policy and you know, the purchasing policy to see. Um, where we assign that responsibility. Um, it may be the purchasing agent. Do you remember, Jim? You see me? I'm um, speaking and I have my phone on, I mean, I'm staying on mute, but I believe Angela may be correct. I don't think that the purchasing policy, the purchasing policy just references if we receive a grant that we must follow the the um, the restrictions of the grant. Yes, but I don't think we spelled out the fact that it must go to council for approval. Although we, I, I think we do that, but it's not spelled out. I don't think it's spelled out in here. Well, because our reading is, I would take the city manager as the final mm -hmm. per this sentence as the final authority. Um, that it didn't seem like the grant. And I'm saying that to say, because knowing how the feds and all that work in the sense that, yeah, they would, the, uh, the council would be binding the city with respect to the um, acceptance of the grant awards. So I think that's something in there should probably be in there with regards to the um, language discussing it going before the council, unless that's in another, Maybe I have it as well. Would that be no, I, I think you're. I think you are right. I don't think it is spelled out in the purchasing policy. Okay. Even though that you know, of course, like the ARPA money or CARES Act money, all of that did go before council, but it's not spelled out. I don't think it's spelled out in here. Right. So okay. that that e is yeah. That's. That's, and that's related to procuring, I'm saying, or even accepting the grant. Right, yeah. Oh, okay. I just wanted to see if we even reference. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. If not, if something should, you know, if it's somewhere else, it probably needs to be included with this area. Because um, if the city manager should approve, which is it the city manager or is it the council? Yeah, we, yeah, you're right. We need to clarify because there's a role for both. Okay. And we need to um, be more specific about what each player, what, you, what the role is for each player, council and city manager. Because I know, my, or, you know, before the commission would approve it, but let's say the chair had the signatory authority to sign on behalf of the commission. Uh, so in this case, I guess, um, if we say the city manager is the designated authority to, you know, maybe enter into contract, grant award, sign, but as far as approving to even accept and enter into that agreement, um, somewhere the council should be noted here as the body to accept the award. Okay. 
Yeah, it says that in that first sentence, but it's it's at the end of the sentence. And I don't I think it needs to be more pronounced somewhere else. Okay. Okay. Accepts, but just document that formal process of bringing the grant to the city for approval. Yes, yes, yes. And then it should, but it does say, you know, the resolution authorizing the application and acceptance and the notification grant award. All of that should go before council. Oh, okay. Uh, but I but I don't think reading it as it's written that it definitely tells you that. Right, right. that the board is accepting right. the award. Okay. So I think we just need to change how that looks, but that is what would go before council. Oh, okay. 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 That's what it looks like there. And we may have actually, we may need to spell out, and I know we have Department of Finance, but we need to spell out um, who in the Department of Finance is responsible for what role in the grant administration as well. Well, that was another part of my other question about that administration aspect. We talk about fulfilling the financial reporting and accounting, but there are programmatic reporting. So that requires or may require programmatic type reporting, not just financial reporting, or is this um, with the grants? And so is that gonna be on the finance department or the actual departments, or uh, I think you were referring to them as the, the department uh, or receiving department, unless it's the receiving department, someone there preparing the programmatic aspects of the grant. No. Okay, so all of it's running through the finance department with regards to any financial and programmatic tax reports. Well, that's the important. way it reads, but I'm not I'm not confident that that's the way we're going to do it. Oh, I see. I get you. Okay, so, okay. So we need to go back and kind of talk through. Yeah, because okay. their grants, most of them, if they're federal, they're going to have programmatic types of reports that people who are boots on the ground that understands the day-to-day -day about whatever that grant programmatic side is uh, preparing those kinds of reports, um, which who's ever responsible for that if they don't submit those. So someone does need to keep tabs of that. I'm saying someone, whether it's the city manager or designee, because if that person's whoever responsible on the receiving department don't, um, it can block out someone in the finance department from receiving funds or drawdowns or what have you with regards to those grants, particularly federal grants. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. We, um, I'm glad you brought that up because one, I'm sure that G and her finance team do not want to be responsible for the program. Exactly, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she has a problem with that. Yeah, <laughs> so, so that probably needs to be spelled out here about who that's going to be, the programmatic yeah. aspect so that person knows their role as well right. uh, with regards to the programmatic yeah. types of reporting. Um, Although something needs to flow up to some level to know that it's been done. Right. Um, and so oh, and point, that needs to be make sure that that is present in the training, um, not just about following purchasing policies in general, but when it comes to grant administration, making sure that that role is spelled out for that, uh, whoever's responsible for that program area to make sure that they know they need to be doing that too. Yeah. And then the aspect about the city manager designated maintaining the records. Now, is this some of the records? Because again, back to there's going to be records or should be records with regards to the programmatic side of the house as well. So all the day-to-day, -day, whatever they're doing. So is somewhere that needs to be captured about their responsibility and that they should maintain those records. Right. Because mm -hmm. this only talks about the application, the notification, financial stuff, uh, but nothing on the program yet, So, Okay. So we need to, I got to know, we need to elaborate a little more on the programmatic side mm -hmm. um, and differentiate between the responsibilities from the programmatic and the financial side. And then the auditing piece, just want to indicate that the reference to the single audit um, need to probably move away from that to the um, 2 CFR 200, the uniform guidance. That's the newer lingo with regards to really following for the single audit or anything to do with audits is encompassed in the 
uniform guidance. I don't know if y'all heard of the uniform guidance or the two CFR 200. Yeah. So really it should more reference the two CFR 200, which encompasses, I call it the Bible of grants. And it encompasses all of the audit requirements and anything to do with federal grants. That makes it easier too. Yes. So if that changes, that changes, you know, anything updated with that, that'll make it all encompassing. So that way people know to refer to that document when they're like dealing with federal grants. Got it. And then Jen, if you, when you get to the SOP side of dealing with your training and grants, um, I can offer to help you with any of that aspect as a, the SOP side of some of the day-to-day. -day. Thank you. So let me know. I think a good example of this, um, and it was presented at the work session, was that freight cluster grant award. So that came out of economic development, but of course, um, JB or economic development will have um, their reporting that they'll need to do, but then there'll also be some of the financial piece of that. So that's a good example of why we need to spell out the receiving department and mm -hmm. the ability, responsibilities versus the financial responsibilities. Because it's the intent, oh, that's the thing I forgot. So with regards to, because as the city get more and more federal direct grants and so forth. So for example, are we saying the city, well, I guess you're the city manager or his or her designee, because when it comes to a lot of those systems, they're online, um, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm assuming then the city manager is not going to be sitting there doing all this pushing buttons <laughs> online for a lot of this stuff. So probably someone to be designated on behalf of, I'm assuming. To, okay, to be the button pushers and so forth in those federal systems. Okay. The, the financial button pusher. Right. Okay, okay, I get you. Okay. And one last thing, so I'm gonna make sure I'm clear. So when the council approves, they're approving uh, is it the application and acceptance of the award if awarded? Is that the resolutions are doing? Yeah. Oh, I see. It says authorized the application. It's, okay, mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Apply mm -hmm. and accept. Okay, cool. And to Gia's point, with the freight cluster, we the um, the economic development department presented the application and, of course, made the sale to us and why we needed to apply for it and what the benefits were, and then we had to vote to allow to approve him submitting the application for the grant and then once and then just this past um, council meeting or work session rather um the we were notified that we were awarded so now on monday we will have to vote that um i don't know if it's, I can't remember if it's a resolution or ordinance but maybe a resolution uh to accept the award so it's kind of two phases we had to we had to approve the application and then we'll, and we'll have to approve acceptance of the award. Okay, so it's not one. No, it's not all in one step. No. Oh, okay. Okay. So I guess we can make that B and then make that the acceptance C. Because we did an apply and accept in one swoop because sometimes it's just was kind of cumbersome, but I guess some people do. That's the way we did it, but that doesn't mean. I mean, it makes well, sense. If we're going to approve the application, why wouldn't we accept the award? You know? Right. Uh, yeah. The award might be for a different amount and it might That's have right. strings attached that you didn't know about. Yeah. That we wouldn't know in the application process? Correct. Possible. No, yeah, some of the terms and conditions don't come till later, but um, I mean, I know my, my past period, nobody ever turned any grant, but yeah, there's. It was just a lot more streamlined, but because sometimes when you're doing a lot with the Fed systems um, to come back twice, it was just something that we didn't apply and accept. But some places do do the application, and then if they get it, come back um, and accept it. But there's always strings attached with any federal grant, so you know <laughs> that's just part of the oh, yeah. part of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> No, they're don't. always there so um other than you know if they have matching requirements which you would know that in the front end with the right. application but otherwise all the rest of it is just what it is 
Um, so. Once the council approves receiving it, I assume that in some cases a form needs to be signed saying we accept it. Who signs that? He's the CFO, man. Sorry? Our CFO should. Should that be said here? Just like it says, it's actually, depending on what it says, the city manager would be responsible for signing the acceptance of it. Like the one that's coming, I'm, I would have to go back and look at it, but I think it may be, it, it may not be me. Let me just say that. Well, part of your policy is as the city manager. Yeah, for what I'm reading, I would have said the city manager. Yeah. yeah, and I think even with this and a couple of other places, the city manager and the CFO is interchanged in some, in the financial place, in different financial policies or financial places, whether it's an ordinance or um, policy. So it's always, you really have to read to see who actually has that authority. Well, who has the authority to bind the city? So who's the party? Once the board approves a contract, who's the signatory to bind the city? In all other contracts. Actually, it goes to... Yeah, it depends. It, it, it really depends. I, I really, oh. It really depends on what it is. Because sometimes the council will say they approve for the city manager to sign that is authorized. Oh. Or authorized to move forward with it, and then sometimes it's the mayor, mayor pro tem that actually signs with the city attorney and all of those at the city. Right, that's what I was going to say. Sometimes it's actually the second official um, oh. representing, hey. like you said, mayor pro tem or mayor. Um, so some yeah, it depends. But I, that's why I think it's important that we have or his or her designee because um, yeah. mm -hmm. even for some of the um, grant funds, like we received LMEG um, grant funds, but sometimes, of course, as, as you all know, we have to set up different accounts. And then somebody has to sign off on, is that we're accepting the money? Yes, but is it going into the right place? So we want the CFO involved in that. So, yeah. Um, so I know they always refer to the authorized representative, which who's the authorized, which can be yeah. anybody, but yeah. Okay. yeah. We've toyed back, and this is good. That's funny you brought that up because we've gone back and forth and toyed around with, do we just say the representative? And then sometimes we've done that and then we come back and go, well, who is that? You know, is that? <laughs> and then there's like, I thought it was so and so. Well, no, it's so and so. You know, so we're like, okay, scratch that. We're not going to use representative anymore. We're just going to define who it is, so mm -hmm. that there isn't. Um, and then we actually found it a little bit easier to say, okay, we'll say the city manager or his or her designee. That way, in instances where it may be mayor or mayor pro tem or maybe CFO, that that falls under designee, and then we've kind of covered the basis. Um, but to your point, though, we need to flush this out a little bit more. In okay. And my feeling about that is, I need to say this nicely, there may be difficulty in the mayor executing his duties or their duties in the first half of next year. Um, and perhaps getting the word mayor out of this document, wherever that is reasonable, and not spiteful would be a good thing to do. Unless it's written by charter. Yes. Under that, those roles and responsibilities. Yeah. yeah. And Which probably the charter is the first place to look for, for who's responsible for some things. Uh, right. financial. There could also be, I, I assume somebody's keeping a running list <clears throat> of items that the the, the Charter Review Commission or committee, whatever that is, when it forms, will be asked to look at. And yeah. those could be could be something. Yes, there is a list, I can tell you that. But Actually, one more thing with grant, with grant on the expenditure, but uh, on the expenditure section where it talks about, what did I say, approving expenditure. Well, Settlement under of grants? Under the well, no, it was on the expenditure, but I was going to ask, but it says settlement of dispute. Oh, that's only under dispute because the Department of Finance shall review expenditure documents for compliance and appropriateness and blah, blah, blah. I was thinking for any expenditure, but not necessarily. That's just only if it's a 
the spew, because my question was going to be, any expenditures runs through the finance department for compliance uh, and appropriateness? Is that part of the review of the finance team? Or this was okay. just talking about, in this case, of just to settle a dispute. Angela, what's a um, expenditure document? Looking at step right under the grants, the next section three expenditure, page 17, and I'm on page 18. Yeah, under C, um, settlement C. of dispute. I just happen to be reading it, but it says settlement of dispute, which I was mistakenly probably thinking the Department of Financial Review expenditure documents. So I was thinking the department's reviewing all the expenditure documents for compliance. And so it came to me, since it mentioned compliance, I was thinking. With grant compliance as well, for any expenditure, did that include? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Or is this just only talking about disputing any? I didn't understand. It says settlement of dispute, though. That's what's now throwing me off. That is titled it. Yeah, because it's under expenditures in general. But I think so. Tell me if I'm following you correctly. You're you wanting to know if that if that is applicable to even grant expenditures. And yes. I would say yes, it's it's applicable to every expenditure, regardless of the of the source of the funds. Okay. Source. Which just takes stuff to another level of compliance now, with, which I'm bringing that up to say if that in fact included that aspect of that's a lot more training of the individuals understanding the grant and the compliance aspects of that as well. So that's why I kind of was, you know what I mean? So yes, that's, that's another layer of training. And wherewithal to understand this expenditure is coming across, oh, that's grant related, does it comply with the terms and conditions of the grant itself as well? Yeah, so we need to, in, in beefing up the grant administration section, we need to add language about expenditures and compliance and review. The grant agreement, whatever the grant um, relates to that grant itself right. as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, Madam Chair, if you go back to page 16, it references um, at the bottom of the page, all grant revenues and expenditures, including matching, must be appropriated even the budget. And then it says the city manager shall approve grant applications and submissions. So there is the answer to that question. About expenditure? No, the oh. application and submissions. Um, so I, 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 I don't know if it answers that question or it. Um... Well, that's the sentence I originally saw. And that's why I asked that question about the city manager. And that's why I started with the kind of question. Where does the oh, council that's right. one? Yeah. That's why it's together. And that's why B is all in one line. Um, city managers shall approve grant applications and submissions that allow both the submission of the grant application and the acceptance of the grant application of the grant award. What exactly does that mean? I'm having trouble parsing that. So that's why I asked that question. If the city manager is accepting it, where does the council actually accept, approve yeah. and accept? Yeah, that's why I asked that question. Yeah, we need to, we need to. Also look it. at that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We need we need to make sure that this sentence, this paragraph, or rather this sentence matches what this process is. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. But you, you were saying all grant revenue and expenditures, including matching requirements, must be appropriated either in the current budget or included for the appropriation of the subsequent budget. Yeah. Right. Which is fine. I think we need to add language about the expenditures. Mm -hmm. um, who's responsible for? Making sure that there's a review. Um, the with the grant. For those mm -hmm. So then maybe just literally adding that sentence here as well so that it's here, but it's also outlined under the expenditure under the so here we can we'll talk about it. We can add that this includes expenditures from all fund sources. Mm -hmm. Covering grants, but then mm -hmm. the grant section, make sure we spell out, spell that again. Yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. What else? What else we got? 
Is it weird that this is like cool? <laughs> I'm, out on it. I'm excited. Give me more. Oh, we're nervous. We're nervous. <laughs> Did you really want now? <laughs> Let's keep it going. I like it. Yeah, I, uh, I got a couple of things when you get to reporting. We can go there. Unless, Angela, you got something else that comes before reporting? I haven't memorized that. No. Uh, no. It's like 34, 30, 33 of this. No. Uh-uh. Okay. Yeah, I'll see. I got something on this access, but I can't find my note on it, but I may come across it as we talk through. I had a question about something under fixed assets. All right, where does reporting begin? Auditing, financial reporting, here we go. Yeah. The first thing is, um, we talk about financial reporting to the city council. There is nothing in this describing our policy about transparency in financial reporting. And while I don't think it would change anything on a practical level, I think it would be a very good statement of the city's orientation to transparency to also say financial reporting to the public, all annual and monthly reports shall be made available to the public via the city's website. I'm not saying we don't do it. I'm just saying if we codify it, it's just one of these things that it should be in, I would like it to be in the city's DNA to codify transparency whenever possible. Yep. I don't see, I don't see how that's harmful at all. Okay. Uh, well, oh, I'm sorry, real quick. So it says the public shall have access. So what are you adding, Dave? The public shall have access to reports that I allow them to. So... Just a more proactive saying that all reports, all financial reporting shall be made available to the public via the city's website. Oh, okay. okay. This word is going to be the sentence up a little bit more. Add, we we got to okay. add the word transparent somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another thing was, and these are kind of a, not quite related items is that currently um, in all the financial reporting I see in the monthly reports are based on annual totals rather than monthly totals. Obviously the income is on monthly totals, but some things like business license revenue um, is a very, a very lumpy thing during the year. It's not spread out evenly. And if somebody was looking at, say, a, a May financial statement, it could say, okay, there's a million and a half dollars budgeted for business license income, and we've received none. And that could be a cause for concern when, in fact, nobody ever expected to have any of it in May, but it comes in whatever times it usually comes. Mm -hmm. And I think doing the budgets on a monthly basis would provide a better sense of whether the city is indeed on the correct course and speed for each of the budget categories as well as the whole. Dave, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, Madam Chair, I, I, if, may I answer that? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned that because the way, and I just had this, this um, I just had a meeting with um, my revenue team just, I think it was yesterday or the day before. But the and we mentioned the same thing. Depending on when you look at our um, at, at a at a report, it will look like we have spent more than we have earned. But it's simply because of how the revenue actually comes in. Yeah. And it does not come in until um, really third and fourth quarter. But this is in the fall, right? Third, yeah, second, third, and fourth. So the first quarter is not a lot of revenue unless it's. Um, some business license start coming in, um, some of your building permits that are kind of carried over from previous years, stuff like that. So we don't have a lot of revenue in the beginning of the year. Um, 
So we are also looking at that as well and looking at some things as how we can smooth that out some because it is we we recognize that as well. So we're looking at it, but it's it's just hard based on how the revenue comes in with our revenue streams. And then correct me if I'm wrong though, even, even if we were to make even if we were to switch to that monthly financial reporting for the public, it would still show expenses and no revenue for those months. Yeah, it, it'll it'll be the same. And, and I was going to ask David, because if he's saying like right now, it's just a year to date. Each month is a year to date. So you would have to say um, between April and May, what was the difference between those two to see what the expenses were for that month or, or what have you. But either way, it's going to be the same thing. The revenue is still not going to be there. What I'm thinking is that, and I'll, I'll make up some numbers. Um, okay. Say we expect, let's say we, we expect $3 million in business licenses to come in in June. And um in may say may year to date we expect a hundred thousand well if may year to date shows seventy thousand then it looks like a thirty thousand dollar problem which it is um the, it's and looking at the year to date at that point it just I think it's a more accurate picture of what we expected, given the, the typical distribution of business license uh, revenue. We expect very little of to come in May. Then we get to June, and we, at the end of June, hey, we have 3 million or 3.1, and we now see year to date we're ahead, but we also know that there's another $200,000, dollars 400 whatever projected for this month, that month, this month. I think it just gives us a better picture of when yeah that's it it's a better picture of when income has arrived that we expect and when it hasn't so you almost want to see a monthly financial position report versus revenues and expenditures because and this let me walk down that thought path in order for us to say we projected this in this month and we received this, we would have to break out the projections monthly, the projected revenue, where yes. our projected revenue was annual. We expect business licensing to annually, um, I will use three million. We expect that this year we will collect three million in, in, in revenue and in business licensing. We, we do not project by month. We do not break that 3 million out by the 12 right. And right. well, We shouldn't divide by 12. We should look at percentage curves or how we, we should look at it in some way that GM wants to do it. Um, okay, so we can brainstorm about, and maybe that's another meeting, but we can brainstorm about how do we produce, I guess a monthly, I'm gonna call it a financial position, but because we don't want to say we don't want to say okay it's three million for the for the year and then we divide that by twelve periods because again that's not that's not going to give you what you want because we're not going to get that percentage each period it may be zeros for the first six periods and then the hundred percent is only divided by six periods not by twelve so in order to achieve kind of that monthly um, yeah I mean in order for us to to depict where we are monthly based on what we projected annually, we've got to divide out what we think that annual projection would be per month. And I'm going to take another, I'm going to step out on another limb and say that may be easier to do come FY23. And the G is probably cringing. Um, because I, I would want to do that based on a prior year that collections and reporting was correct. Not based on a year where there were some discrepancies. 
So I think the FY22 year will be a better historical basis for us to then try to project monthly in 2023 what that revenue would be. We could project it monthly in 23 based on what we saw the collections to be in 22. So when she pulls the statement, she can see in, in period nine, we received X percent of revenue in right. 2022, right? So maybe when we set it up for 2023, we can say, well, last year we received blank percent in period nine. So let's project that same or a little bit more in period nine of next year and then trend it out that way. But I'd hate to do that on a year, like on a 2021 budget, historical budget. I, I would prefer to do that on a 22 because we know that the accounting and the, and the compliance and, and everything is just in much better shape. I would agree that it will be a more typical year, we hope. Um, it certainly will be in accounting, whether it will be in revenue and world is, is another question. Right. But it seems a shame to abandon the possibility of even getting it a little wrong in 22. And I suspect that on the big things where the accounting has been um, unusual, that there is some sense, okay, we recorded, you know, $2 million in July and August, but really it all came in in September. And you kind of plug that, you make a best guess. Yeah, I don't think it's not possible. Uh, and I'm, I'm more concerned about what it, what it would be on the expenditure side, not so much the revenue side. I think the revenue side would, would end up being fine. I mean, because it is what it is, right? I mean, it's not. Well, a, a lot of the expenditures are going to be flat, divide by 12. Um, not, if to, not if you want the percentage that you're looking for. Okay. If you want to know accurately what percentage of expen of expenditures were received per period, and you want to know accurately the percentage of revenue per month that was re received based on the projected percentage, I don't think dividing it by twelve is what you're looking for. But there are there are some things like um, salaries <laughs> divide by twelve would allow for the fact that we're hiring seventeen new people in third quarter. Um, Gas, you not quite utilities, insurance. Um, th there are a ton of expenses that are fairly flat. Others uh, are I, best guess. Uh, Dave, I agree with what you said on the expense side, but that revenue, I'm more, I guess I'm more focused on the revenue because looking historically, and we know that we probably can put asterisks from um, actually January through maybe May of last year because of, of business licenses. I'm just gonna use that as an example. But even when we got to, let's say September and October, it still wouldn't be a normal year because you still haven't stabilized the transactions, if you will. So that entire year, I mean, we, we still don't know where we are. I mean, know what level is. So then if we come back in 22 and say, let's go month by month, I can't say that, you know, it's $2 million we expect. So I, I think we'll get 250. It may be easier per quarter, maybe, but still not accurate because that first quarter, you're not going to get a lot of business license. Right. Because they're not due. It's for so something like business licenses, it's, You've got to look at history and what the percentage distribution was by uh, by time period. That's the only thing you can do. And if for some reason you think that, hey, there's going to be an event next year that's going to cause a change, you, you, you ballpark it, you plug, you cross your fingers. But I think that's all got to be better than not knowing until the end of the year uh, really how we did well, I, I, and I think the other part of that, um, the processes have changed. So I think our, at some point you'll see our revenues be more consistent 
meaning looking at when something is due and when it's past due and our, our enforcement of the, the um, license procedure. Business license, call, building permits, whatever it is, the enforcement of that will also help our, stabilize our revenue because that's part of the problem. If, I mean, part of the, the issue here is if it's due April 15th and we are, you know, um, already halfway through the first quarter, then we aren't getting a lot. We'll get that in May and June. So I, I think the enforcement piece will kind of help us drive and get a more stable revenue throughout the year. That's what we're hoping. That's what we're hoping internally. It does sound like you're saying that on a year-to-date basis, things have been so unstable that we really aren't going to know um, where we're in good shape or not. Um, I wouldn't say the projections that, that are going to be difficult to compare against. And for us to have, for us to be able to have an accurate projection of what we think we'll get that period, it need, the revenue collection needs to be stable. And I don't know that we'll, I don't know that using FY21 data is going to give us that. But FY22 most certainly should. Because if you use FY21 data to say, and historically, we received 10% of, we'll stick with business license, business license revenue in period three. Well, that could be, that 10% can be way off for a number of reasons. And now that, now in FY22, if we're looking at the comparison and we haven't achieved that 10%, now it appears that our financial position is all over the place when really that 10% projection wasn't an accurate projection to begin with. You know, it strikes me this, this same problem that you just described replicates when you start looking at, say, this June's income versus last June's to figure out if you have a problem or not. If it's different, you don't know if you have a problem or if last June is atypical. Just putting right. that out there too. And it could be that it has no solution. That's what's making what we're doing more challenging than if we had we've had a historical stable environment, but we know we have it. So our challenge is looking at what actually happened versus what we thought should have versus looking at looking into the future and saying, well, we know that that was an abnormal, but we're trying to figure out what that normal looks like. So let's say first quarter, uh, first quarter of FY22, we will be looking very closely at our revenue by month to see where we are. Where are we with business licenses? What does our effort look like in encouraging businesses to pay on time? Right. Not early, but on time, really. And, and certainly, if, if, you know, we, but we've also already had some businesses already paying for 22. So it's just that enforcement and encouragement of our businesses to make these payments, because that's what helps us to have a more stable revenue stream throughout the year. And Dave, this is, this is a report that can be created, right? I don't, I don't think there's a challenge in, can the report exist? Absolutely, I mean, there's, you know, well, I'm going to say people saw financial because <laughs> that's what I use on my day job. But yes, can can this kind of report be created? Sure. What I what I don't want to happen is that there is uh, a miseducation of what the report is representing because there's only a handful of folks who understand why it looks that way. So can we create it? Sure. And can we send it to Dave? Absolutely. But we want to make sure that what what we want to make sure that what is out there um, is something that we can explain, and it resonates and makes sense, and it doesn't cause a frenzy because the data is just not level. And it may be easier to explain just the fact that 
how the revenue comes in versus explaining on a monthly basis why we didn't get $200,000 that we thought we were going to get. Because we really don't know if that's $200,000 or if it's four hundred. dollars But we know that we expect at mid-year to have X number of dollars. And, 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 and um, we can look at it that way, but I think looking at it on a monthly basis, um, I don't know. But I, I like um, Chair so, said, I certainly don't mind putting those types of reports out, but I think we may do more explaining and education to the public on those types of reports versus just um, explaining they, when the revenue comes in. That, I, I can't argue that. But I would say, I would sum up by saying, I personally would like to see our policy be to use monthly um, estimates, monthly forecasts, as well as actuals in reporting starting in 2023. Okay. Yeah. And and forecast, because we'll have more data to be able to forecast. Yeah. For our, yeah. Right. I agree. Um, here is an easy one, um, a little further down fixed assets are defined as assets with a value of $5,000 or greater. It doesn't say if that was an initial value or the depreciated value. And I don't know if it needs to be spelled out. Um, I, I, I think that's initial value. I don't think that's depreciated. Yeah, that's initial value. Yeah, again, I don't, I don't know if that, need, if that should be spelled out or not. Um, in budget reporting, are we, is the policy, because this is not intent, is the policy that we report operating totals, grant funded program totals, and SPLOST stuff separately or is it all interchanged both fine that works for me mm -hmm. both In and it's not that's going to come out of the CAFR anyway Yeah. Yeah. I just don't, I know, <clears throat> I know that it's lost in the first couple of years of the city. It seems to have changed how it was reported and whether he was included in the total budget or not, et cetera. Yeah, it should, it should be represented as it is now as a separate fund um, and should not be included in at least if you're going to if you're going to include it in conversation, it should come with the statement that um, it is reported separately. You know what I mean? Like I've heard this. Oh, I'm going to throw a number out. Um, the city's um, revenue is 15 million dollars, right? Which to, you know, I guess a common listener, it's like, oh, they're getting 15 million dollars in general operating revenue. When actually nine of that is lost, you know, so right. really not a fifteen million dollar budget, you know. So yeah, I think it's just we have to be more careful about how we represent what the revenue is from. Um, and similarly, yeah. expenses, you know, public works. Yes. Would have a chunk that's part of operating expenses, but they would actually have a larger budget because, in part, it would be lost and grant driven. Right. So there needs to be a way, and I don't know if this is a policy thing or an SOP or just something we all know and agree with, um, of getting both those views. Yeah, I, yeah. I think the um, I think the, the the reporting we produce now clearly outlines all of that. I think it's just a matter of those who are having that conversation to speak with knowledge and not with anything else. And the last thing that I have is 
that I would like to see our policy be that the annual budget document clearly states what elements of the master transportation plan, the parks and recreation master plan, and the comp plan are and are not supported by that budget. Say that one more time. I'd like the annual budget document to clearly state, annual, right? I will say, clearly state any elements of, of all of the, the three master plans mm -hmm. that were planned for the fiscal year, but are not supported by the budget. So if I've been dreaming that, you know, the, the bad curve that I live on will get fixed in 2022 because it's number three on the master transportation plan list, if that is not going to happen because it is not being funded, I want to know that at a budget hearing so I can raise my hand and, and ask the council to reconsider that. I don't want to wait until December and think, well, they never got out here to, to do anything. And now it's going to be another year uh, of cars getting wrecked on that curb. Now, this is, this is an accountability thing, too, particularly the comp plan. But all three plans are the roadmap, and they have dates, the roadmap by which the city will move forward. As and long as they're funding to support that. Correct. Correct. Um, but they're, they're, they're out there. If citizens read them, it, is, it creates an expectation. And if we're not going to meet, if the city is not going to meet that expectation, I think, number one, we should be transparent about it. Number two, that we tell people as early as possible, and that is in the annual budget document. Dave, you're asking us to provide a report of things that will not be included versus them looking to see what was included. Because, for instance, you mentioned, did you mention roads? I don't, I don't know what your example was. I mentioned roads, parks, and the comp plan work items. Yeah, so I can see including, trying to move the schedules up so that the general public may know what will be included, but to do the exclusions is a larger list. Because it's, it's everything else that's in the comp plan that we didn't get to. But the other part of that is the um, capital improvement plan, five-year plan should let you know that if, if, if it's not in 22, then it's in 23. And if it's not in 23, then it's in 25 or et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, coming up with the list of exclusions is a larger, is, will always be a huge list. But saying you want us to get to the point where when we present the budget in October, that we can include a list of CIP projects. We can include those other projects so the, the public is aware of what projects we're going to approve for the next year. For transportation and parks, yes. And frankly, people like me will then go oh, go to the transportation plan and look at what's slated but not included and look at the ones that weren't done last year and say, ah, they're not there either. So I'm, because I'm not, I, I don't want to know that, <clears throat> you know, for, for roads, <clears throat> I just want to know What's going to get done in 22 that was promised? What's not going to get done in 22 that was promised? And you, you can do it either way or both. Okay. I, don't, I don't care that 23 is not going to get done in 22. Okay. Um, it's just those lists are what citizens expect. Stonecrest, they're what the citizens expect the government to do. They're our roadmap to a better stone crest. And if we're setting out on that road and we're going to 30 miles an hour rather than 60, let's tell them now and let's tell them what the adjustments are gonna be if we want to, and let's tell them how we're gonna make up for it if we want to, but at least give them the bare minimum that you know we're not gonna to get to Illinois this year, even though the master plan says we're gonna to get to Illinois this year. 
for the work items in the comp plan, those are not all CIPs. And so it's a little, it's not just CIP there. I mean, it's stuff like establish a public art program, which by the way, I mentioned that, that does not mean it's in my top priorities. Um, but you know, the, the city never told anybody that even though the comp plan says we will have an economic development policy in 2019, that we do not yet have one. All right, Dave, let, help me understand. So yeah. is this something, some, one of the policies that you wanted them to incorporate? I'm, I'm kind of got a little. The policy would be that the annual budget document will address or list those items that we could phrase it however we want, included and not included of the ones that were slated in the long-term plans for the year. Basically, it's comparing the short-term plan with the long-term, but what I'm looking for is a policy that we will be transparent and proactive about those things. And yes, by the way, it is going to, citizens are gonna get angry, they're gonna ask questions, they're gonna ask why, and that is, if anybody is at the back of their mind saying, ah, oh, shit, I'm gonna have to answer all these questions, part of my language. Um, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a concern. I think, cause I mean, that, that's what's expected and we don't, we don't have an issue with that. I don't, that's not a problem. I'm trying to think through where is the best place for that to be. And I don't know that in the annual budget document that's supposed to forecast our financial position is the most appropriate place for that. I'm trying to figure out, I hear you and I think it's a good um, recommendation. I think there's a lot to that. Um, one, to Julia's point, if we put in there what is included, I think it's safe to assume that what is not included has been excluded. So I don't know that both are necessary. And like Gia said, the included list will be much shorter than the excluded. But again, kind of coming back to some of the other reports and some of the other conversations we were having is there's so much to the why that if you only give the what you're if you only have the what and you don't have the why the what becomes so much more so it becomes it looks like it's a bigger issue than what it is so and I need to I need to think through how can we satisfy that request without Just because I'm asking for the what doesn't mean the why can't be included. Just as you have uh, what I will think of as the executive summary, but that's not the right word, that always precedes what finance sends to the council as a draft budget. The transmittal. Thank you. I, yes. Right. Yes. The transmittal yeah. um, does, but also the... Um, and it and it was subsequent because Tom Udell did a presentation um, this past work session. But I think getting all of that moved up some so that it all is at the same time. Because the things that he's presenting now in a big picture way were included in the budget. Because yeah. they were included in the budget, but it didn't say we were going to do this list of 10 projects. And you just want to see those list of 10 projects, which I think is something that we can include in the budget document at the end with our five year CIP plan so that you'll see if it's comp plan, you'll see if it's transportation, you'll see if it's parks, you'll see if it's economic, whatever it is, you'll be able to see it and how we when it's on the schedule to be taken care of. So you'll see the big picture, but then you'll see the list of roads you'll see the broad picture and then you can tab somewhere else and see what's, um, what we anticipate to include. I think that's what you are maybe looking for. And see, I think that works for, for roads. I don't know it's gonna be that simple for the other projects because most of the other projects require funding that we don't necessarily know that we'll have at that point. 
Um, Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead. Um, I don't want to say uh, that this is not a part of the uh, finance uh, committee because everything's going to be, well, almost everything will be driven by finance. But to address some of these uh, other issues with like the master transportation plan, the uh, uh, parks master plan, as well as the, uh, the comp plan, uh, it's almost like you need another another committee, dare I say, mm. uh, to, to address some of it. Um, but again, it's all going to come back to finance uh, in the end. So uh, there is a relationship. But uh, is this where we really want to uh, drive this, initially drive this from? Mayor Pro Tem, I yes, expect that when the council votes to votes to accept a budget, that the council has knowledge of which of those things are not being done that were promised to the citizens. And putting it in the budget document ensures that. And uh, ultimately, where we want to go with this is that the committees will make these type of suggestions. Uh, before budget time, so we would, uh, so council would get a good feel for what is expected to be there, uh, coming from all of these areas. Yeah, right. Which I think we're saying the same thing. Which I think we did this budget cycle. It, it's it's the I think what at least what I'm trying to battle with is the what's not supported, because we provided what was supported. It's the what's not supported, the what and the why. You, I don't think you can just say this is what not support. This is what's not supported, and leave it there. I mean, there's so you know you have to put so much of the what and the why with the not supported. Because I think we did a, especially considering where we came from, I think we did a, a pretty good job of what is supported. I think for transportation, for transportation, I think it was a good job. I'm not as sure it was for parks, but I didn't really dig into that. And for the comp plan, I got to say I missed the, the discussion of those 180 or whatever it is work items and their status. Yeah. I, well, I, I think uh, it provides us with a great opportunity to do better, to, to strive to do better, to be more encompassing for all of those plans as well as any future plans that the city has. I think this year was probably a, a, a big step forward, but is there room for improvement? I'd probably be the first person to say, yes, it is. And, and that's why I'm asking for a, for an addition to the policy um, that the annual budget document will, I'll go back to what I said, will show what is and isn't supported that had been promised to the citizenry for the fiscal year. Now, if you do that, you can add as much explanation of why and how we're going to ameliorate it, or whether it was decided that it simply was a lower priority or anything like that. And I would, I would hope that would be done for the reasons that you all said. But I definitely see us tackling the is. I, I got I to marinate on the is not. It's almost the is. I would say the is not are more important. And I say that for this reason. I assume the city is going to deliver on its promises. I don't want to see the list of what you're going to do, because I assume you're going to do what the plans, the master plans and the comp plan said you're going to do. Um, what I want to know is, you know, what's being changed. Set, reset my expectations, you know, that my curve will get fixed in 2024 rather than 20. 22. And you know something? I'll go to sleep on it until 2024. I won't bug in in 2023. Because now you have reset my expectations. Yeah, I follow you. And like I said, I think that's easier for roads. It's the other ones. I think that's we're going to have to we got to brainstorm how we can make it that simple for parks, for um, the uh, comprehensive plan. I think that's super simple for roads. This is how much we received in revenue for SPLOS. So this is, yeah. <laughs> this is how much we can spend. <laughs> Bam, that's easy. The parks and the comp plan require funding that we don't have a dedicated source of revenue that's coming in for. So even though it may say the city should do these things in FY22, what it doesn't tell you is 
Um, you can do all of those things as long as you have an extra $10 million come in, right? So if we don't have that extra $10 million, then, that, then, then the timeline continues to be pushed back until there's revenue to support the projects. So I think it's much easier to do that, like I said, for roads because there's a spot. But for the comp plan, for the parks plan, there isn't a separate dedicated fund source to put toward meeting the timeline that was written in those master plans two years ago. Yeah, but and, and, and I do agree that you set priorities and you should be lopping something off of the top uh, each year. And uh, based on the funding, determines how much you lop off the top and uh, get accomplished. And I think, uh, again, back to citizen input or committees uh, from the citizen input, will kind of determine what those priorities are. And council will have to determine where to put the resources that we do have. I agree with that. And I add, and then turn around and after you decide the priorities and figure out which ones it looks like can be funded for the year, turn around and tell us. Okay. Jasmine, yeah. some, some of these are big things. Most of the stuff in the, in, in the comp plan is much smaller. I mean, there are $5,000 items in there. There's develop a policy that may, may not even have a dollar figure attached. Oh, um, but it does, because <laughs> there's a salary attached to a person. Oh yeah, there's a cost. <laughs> okay, right, there's a cost, obviously. But some of them may not be opportunity costs. Some just may be subsumed into operating. Um, I think we got it, Dave. I think we got it. I okay. think I think we can come up with a solution that um, will work for for everything. I think we got it. We got to work on it, but I think we understand what you're saying. Thank you. I will stop eating that dead horse. <laughs> not dead. It, it's not because it's it's, but, it's doable. It's doable. It's we'll figure it out. Okay, what else? We're at 842. We're still on financial management policy. But this is good. I mean, the other ones we can, we can talk through. Yeah, I'm not sure if we, I, I just want everybody to look at this and maybe if you have some some suggestions, maybe even not today, but uh, later. If, if you all look at section F, G, and I'm not sure what the contingency was, one was, but it's all related to um, one says an opportunity fund, one says a contingency fund, and then the other one says budget stabilization resources. And um, with knowledge, I just want y'all to look at those three sections and, and possibly provide some feedback on those. Is it F? What are we looking F is budget stabilization. Um, I, I read it and I should have put the page number on the policy. Let me see. Hmm. What are we talking about? Part of it? Uh, well, okay. Are you under, are we still on financial reporting? Yeah, it is. Oh. Okay. Budget stabilization. Is that what you said? Uh -huh. That is on page number five. Oh. Oh, yeah, it's F G and I think maybe I. Okay, so it's under it's under the yeah. equity policy section. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's F G and L. Uh, and we don't have a discussion on it. I just would like for you all to take a look at it and um, FG, I don't know where you're talking about. FG. It's in the beginning <laughs> on the budget. Um, Search for the word budget stabilization. Or yeah. just okay. stabilization. I saw that, I saw that but there was only an A and a B. Mm -mm. Go down. Down. This, this is A and B. There's budget stabilization. Mm -mm. No, this is way before that. This is. Yeah, it's all the way up at the top. 
It's on page five. In the beginning. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, five, yeah, right there. F, G, and L. We don't have to talk about it now. I just want you guys to take a look at it. Is there any state law around that? Um, that's why I want you all to look at it. I, okay, I, because, I think there's something related to the reserve, yeah. but I'll look at it. It is, yeah. but I just want to make sure we are um, in line with, with what it should be. And I just, I, I don't want to say what I think, but I just want to want you all to take a look at it because it's different percentages and they're extremely high. And that 25%? Yes. It did look high. I was, yeah, I thought maybe. Really that, though. Don't we have a. We have a resolution for that. I think that's why it says 25. Okay. Do we have a um, fund balance resolution? The, I, if I'm not familiar with it, if we do. Because I would think the council would have said, I'm, the, right. Georgia may have a minimum, but then <clears throat> the council might have set a different, you know, maybe a higher level threshold. I got to do some research because I believe that that was in one of the first. Well, when I read that 25% raised my eyebrows, but I guessed it was standard. Uh -uh. I'll, I'll do some digging too. I think we we have a um, well. We talked about it, but I know there. I know in one of the first audits that was a recommendation to come back and set a fund balance. I swear we did it. So I guess the question for me then, are these actions F and G by a wishes of the council, by some resolution? If not, then you want to know if these are in line with any other um, government policy state requirements as well, Jean? Yeah, because I don't have any historical on it. Like, oh. I don't... Um, Chair, Chairwoman Powell mentioned that they may have done a re resolution. I just don't have a historical on it. And I just want to make sure that it's council approved, but I'm not sure. And I'm not sure also if, if um, I just know we need to bring this policy back with some revision. So let me say that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look. I'm going to look in the minutes. I mean, we got to go back, but it would have been in like 17. 17, yeah. 17, 18. Mm -hmm. Because we did a budget the first year. I mean, we, I'm sorry, we did a audit the first year, even though we weren't required to. And it, it was either a recommendation in the first or second budget. So it was either 17 or 18. I think we started talking about this, G, and then I stopped looking. Um, but we, I need to go back to it because I swear we did that. I don't remember. Gia, just to make sure I'm understanding this, the opportunity fund is, well, contingencies are for things that impact budgeted expenses and revenues, where the opportunity fund is for things that were not even considered in the budget. Is that accurate? Yes, yes. Thank you. Y'all gonna have me up all night digging through those minutes because I swear we did. Don't don't do it. <laughs> I just I just want to make sure going well, what we have. I guess is the opportunity fund. So we're talking about 10%. Put this how this reads 10%. So mm -hmm. we're talking about 35%. It wasn't 10% in addition to the 25%. That's the way it reads. That's what's written. And so then if you scroll on down to I, I mean L. Uh-huh. Then you got 2%. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, that's that's a lot. Um yeah, I don't know it wasn't that high. I want to say it was like 20 in total. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to bring that to, to you all's attention so that we could address it and, and yeah, that is something to really look into for sure. Okay. Now, the stabilization resources, they're hopefully going to carry over from year to year untouched. Yes. 
So it's not going to take 25% of each year's budget. It could take zero. Well, it could take only the delta, the increase between this year and last year. Yeah, if it's needed. Yeah. If it's needed. If it's needed, right. If, yeah. yeah. I don't even think it's that high, though, Dave. I'm going to find it. I don't even think it's that high. Oh, I'm, I'm not saying it should be 25%. Um, that seems real high to me. But... I had a, well, question on the... We're back, back. We were talking about financial reporting. Um, with regards to the internal one, I guess I'm back on page 35. Um, but before we get there, page 33, auditing, auditing, auditing. Yeah, on the auditing, um, again, that first paragraph talking about the Georgia law, um, when it talks about auditing, the last sentence with regards to just updating that language with regards to single audit, again, the 2 CFR 200. Uh, versus all the language with the 1996 single audit amendment and such. Um, that's a question I have with auditing, choosing the audit firm. So it talks about a um, choosing the audit firm for a period of five years with two five renewal options. Does that mean the intent is to potentially have a firm on board for 15 years? For a period of five years. She's an audit firm for a period of five years with two five-year renewal options. So potentially, one could be the auditors for 15. And I know that, that that is what's written, but our contracts typically is a one plus four. What right. That's what I thought. Typically, a contract, well, the audit typically would follow the same contract provisions you and any other contract. Is that what you're saying? Y'all have a standard for all contracts? Yes. So should that be follow the same? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a long time. <laughs> Not to say you can't, you know, be bid on it and so forth, but to say that's the standard, that's, yeah, okay. Yes. So that needs to be in line with what the normal procurement contracting is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why is this contracting process different than other contracting processes? It should not be. I think that's what the point. Mm -hmm. So why is it even in here? I was just, I, my note was to strike it. That's what I wrote. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't think it should talk about that here either. Okay. I think B uh, is appropriate and that's it. Okay, cool. I don't um, even see, I don't think that D I, I wrote a C and D. Mm hmm mm hmm The agreement, right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Well, actually, the whole qualification. Well, let's see. So. Yeah, I mean, B. I thought B was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was, yeah. Well, then it started talking about internal audit, but then somewhere else under reporting starts to talk about internal audit. So then that's where I want to bring up under financial reporting. So in the auditing, it mentions E, internal audit. Then we're on the financial reporting. It's a little bit, a lot more verbiage talking about internal audit under financial reporting. Of which under E, external financial reporting, um, that first sentence blurb, um, seems to be discussing the reports due to the state mm -hmm. of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And if so, I was just thinking maybe that heading could be a little differently because again, we talked about financial reporting, talking about the CAFR uh, and so forth <coughs> on the A, B and such. So I didn't know this E, is this more specifically related to uh, the state reporting? That's first on the e-external reporting. Yeah, are, and are you saying just change the title? 
the heading? Yeah, I'm thinking because again, if I were wanting, because if I want to find out about financial reporting, we talk about the CAFR and all that under A and such. But then this report, if I read it correctly, I'm you know the state OG. Um, that's a compliance with the state of Georgia reporting that's due to them, unless that could be a part of the CAFR, because all of that's due to the state. The right. CAFR. Why, why, why are you restating this, I guess? Is yeah, that's what I see. yeah, so that's a separate statement, really, that could be incorporated with the annual financial report, because that's really what's due to the state as well. Right. Which is what we actually have as an example in that sentence. Mm-hmm. A is about the CAFR in general. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, I see why you have it. Because you have financial reporting to the city council, financial reporting to administration. So I don't know if this was just talking about other types of financial reports. But, but it's really the CAFR that's going to the state and any of right. their that's, other... This CAFR and the single auditor are going to the state. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. yeah. And actually, that sentence doesn't talk about the. Okay. It will give them. Yeah. So that maybe can be combined possibly with the other or. Um, yeah, I think we can move it. I think we can find a better place for it. But it right under that, though, internal audit was one. Uh, are we talking about, well, I guess the question I have who hires? What does the internal audit tour report to? City Council. Okay. So I don't think I saw. Which is a recent change. Mm -hmm. It's a recent change. So I don't think I saw anything. From, I was looking to see where, where's the scope. Well, so who determines the scope and such? So I was looking to see who directs the work of the internal audit? Does anyone, the scope as what they're going to be tasked with? Technically, technically it's the city council. Now we did an RFP. Um, so the scope was written of course in the RFP based, based on what the charter designates as the internal auditor's role. And then of course we added to that we made sure that was at the basic minimum, but we added to that as well to develop the scope for the RFP. So um, okay. we can make this language align a little bit better with the charter. Although the charter is it's still very simple. I don't want to mislead you to think that there is a robust definition in the charter because um, it's not. But we could make sure that it aligns, at least the language is reconciled against it. And again, this was created years ago. <laughs> um, and the charter, we just changed that in SB 21, um, just in April. So that we, we need to reconcile this section probably in general um, to make sure. So, so the internal audit is a contract, not an employee. I, I, so maybe I'm mistaken. No, know. well, it can be either. We chose for it to be um, a firm. Okay. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it will always be that way. So the council just decided this year that it would be affirmed, but it has been previous, it has been a person. Mm -hmm. So it can be either. But I guess to your point though, is this, is this about an internal audit or an mm -hmm. internal auditor? Yes, that's my, yeah. Cause yeah, that's what I was, cause I talked about school. So you're right, I was, when I started reading it, I was thinking, oh, you're talking about internal, cause I know there was an internal auditor so that's why I went down that path. But then I started reading. They talked about the audit schedule and then an independent audit contractor. So I got a little confused about are we talking about internal audit function or having an internal audit? Is, I, uh, I think it may should have stated internal auditor or internal auditor function or something like that. Because what's on there, like the audit schedule, I don't know if it lists, but like the charter says quarterly audits. But right. all the items that's listed on the B, it mm -hmm. is how the internal auditor determined, you did an in, uh, uh, initial assessment to be able to determine what their quarterly work product would be or will be. Okay. 
Could I ask why the finance director is referenced in paragraphs B and C? What is it says? Uh, to work with the finance director? So that's what I was asking was who's their phone? If it's an internal auditor, who are they reporting it to? Yeah. For the council. If when I saw a finance director, but then when I they saw... say work with the finance director, it's just to provide whatever it is that they're asking for. Document, yeah. I don't have any, I don't direct their work and I don't approve their work. Okay. They all um, operate independent of. So the gist of this section is then to mention what an, an internal audit, the internal whether it be audit. done by an independent contractor or an employee, is mm -hmm. focusing in on an, an internal audit. Yes. Okay. I think that was the intention, but we need to. We probably need to review it just because of the change in the charter and specifically the how it's actually written out in terms of the scope of the of what the internal okay. is actually performing. Okay. It needs to still read where even if there were changes to the scope that this is still generally applicable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think okay. it's a little too specific and it may need to be a little bit more generalized. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I had, I think that was cool. Okay. Well, okay. So with that, then I didn't know you have auditing section. We have an E internal audit, and then on the financial reporting. You talk about internal audit. So I don't know whether it's probably under auditing, would it be more conducive there under auditing versus under financial reporting? Um, that's a good point. Uh -huh. to be highlighted, I mean, not highlighted, bold in a separate section to know, let you know you've gone from financial reporting to internal audit. That may be what it is. So the, the expectation on the financial reporting is that there will be a report from the internal audit. Well, I'm saying internal audit. There will be some type of report with regards to an internal audit. Audit, right. So yeah, yes. the, the, that's where that is. That's where it's confused. So we yeah. under financial reporting, we need to stop at the audit itself. That is another financial report. Yes. Yeah. And then we get into the scope, the schedule, the access to records. That should that, that should fall under uh, audit. Right. Mm -hmm. On the auditing. Yeah. So maybe that's another report of the internal audit report. Right. Okay. And the work and so forth would be under audit. Mm -hmm. okay. That's it. So. That was it I had so far. Dave, is it was there anything else on your list for the financial management audit? No, no, I had some of the same questions about the auditor, but nothing else. Okay. This was good. We needed this. Um this will help formulate what we're <clears throat> excuse me, where we're trying to get with all of our financial policies. So this is this is good conversation. We will hold going over the fleet policy and the purchasing car policy for um, our January meeting. G and I will work on all these notes, compiling it, getting it back out. We'll send it back out to you. 
in our next meeting, we'll go back over this, make sure we captured everything. Don't throw your notes away. <laughs> we captured everything. And um, we'll try to get through um, the uh, person car policy and the purchasing policy in our next meeting. The fleet policy, I believe, is scheduled to be on our agenda for the council to approve on Monday. Um, I think it's going to be there. Um, I know there were some, we, the council recommended some changes in the work session. Um, so I'm not sure if, if we'll get all of that done and ready for Monday. If it is not, then we can review it in our next meeting um, in January. If it is already passed, it's okay. We can still review it. And if we have other recommendations, we can submit those to the council and um, you know, just make another update to the policy. We wanted the fleet policy out there because we expect to receive um, the vehicles right before Christmas. So we did not want to not have a policy in place already. Um, so even if we do approve that policy before we meet again, we can still go through it. And if again, there's some more recommendations for changes, we can talk through them and then present that to council for a secondary review and acceptance of fleet policy. So don't worry about that. Um, if you do have, if you have read it and you do have some updates, um, feel free to send that over. But I think we are expected to ex um, approve that policy on Monday. So send your notes if you have them. If not, read over it and just collect them and we'll talk about it in our next meeting. Thank you so, so, so much for your time. This was good, good, good conversation. I'm excited to have all these great brains at the table sorting through this stuff. It really is helpful. I know I'm speaking for Gia, but it's helpful as a council member as well to, um, you know, just get some feedback from other eyes and other experts in the field. So we appreciate your time. Our time is up. I won't hold you any longer. Um, thanks for giving us this two hours. Have a great holiday. Enjoy. Time. We'll send this email out, follow it up. Um, and then we'll meet again in January. Did we have a, um, in my, if, in my met a miss today. Did we have no, I we got to turn. Yeah, so Gia, we'll sit, Gia and I will sit down and talk. Oh, okay. Okay. On Thursday, okay. Where are we? Third Thursdays? Um, we'll try to keep it on that schedule. We, oh. The council has to reconstitute committees as well, so we'll do that um, at the beginning of the year. But when we send the follow-up email, I'll try to I'll throw the dates out as well, and, and we'll talk through any of those that don't work. But um, we'll definitely meet in January. Okay. I will add, thank you, Councilman Turner, Council Person. Cobble or council people, Turner and Cobble. Thank you for your service this year and Ms. Scruggs, you as well, most definitely. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Happy Same year. Time. Happy holidays, everybody. Be safe. Bye -bye. Happy holidays. Thank you. Indeed. See y'all.